Question 1. In the process of active rewarming, you should put pressure on the affected area to rapidly increase circulation. Allow the patient to walk on the affected area to increase circulation. Keep the affected area immersed until the patient feels pain. Keep the affected area wrapped in blankets until transport is available. Answer is C. Keep the affected area immersed until the patient feels pain. During the course of active rewarming, keep the affected area immersed until the water cools, even if the patient complains of pain, then remove the affected part and add more warm water. Complaints of moderate or even intense pain indicate that rewarming has been successful. Do not apply pressure or allow the patient to walk on the affected area. Once rewarming has been completed, apply a dry sterile dressing to the affected area and cover with blankets, but do not allow the blanket to come into contact with the injured area. Question 2. In rescuing a near-drowning victim, you should perform chest compression. Attempt to rescue breathing while the victim is still in the water. Remove the victim from the water before initiating care. Immobilize the victim, then remove the victim from the water. Answer is B. Attempt to rescue breathing while the victim is still in the water. In the case of a near drowning, rescue breathing should be initiated without delay, even if the victim is still in the water. Chest compression is only effective when the victim is out of the water. Question 3. Emergency care for a snake bite includes Cleaning the bite with soap and water Placing ice on the bite Sucking the venom from the bite Capturing the snake Answer is A. Cleaning the bite with soap and water Never attempt to suck the venom from a snake bite do not put ice on the bite unless instructed to do so by a physician or local protocol. The bite should be cleaned with soap and water and the patient transported to the hospital immediately. Question 4. Typical signs and symptoms in a heat emergency patient with hot and dry or moist skin include Heavy perspiration Little or no perspiration Muscle cramps Weak pulse Answer is B. Little or no perspiration Typical signs and symptoms in a heat emergency patient with hot and dry or moist skin include little or no perspiration, full and rapid pulse, and seizures but not muscle cramps. Question 5. Typical signs and symptoms in a heat emergency patient with normal or cool moist, pale skin include rapid pulse, seizures, little or no perspiration, muscle cramps, answer is D. Muscle cramps. Typical signs and symptoms of a heat emergency patient with normal or cool moist, pale skin include muscle cramps, heavy perspiration, and weak pulse rate. Question 6. An example of a medical condition that can mimic a psychiatric condition is heart attack, diabetes, asthma, allergic reaction. Answer is B. Diabetes. Diabetes or low blood sugar can produce symptoms such as hostile behavior, drooling, heavy perspiration, or seizures that mimic those of a psychiatric condition. Question 7. Proper treatment of a hostile or aggressive patient includes Restraining the patient Encouraging the patient to accept emergency care Calling a physician Watching for sudden changes in behavior Answer is D. Watching for sudden changes in behavior The best approach in treating a hostile or aggressive patient is to watch for sudden changes in behavior and seek assistance from law enforcement. Restraining the patient or forcing him or her to accept emergency care is usually not in the legal jurisdiction of an EMTB. Question 8. Proper restraint of a violent patient includes Handcuffs Plastic restraints Leather cuffs Hog tying Answer is C. Leather cuffs Soft restraints such as leather cuffs or belts are acceptable means of restraint for violent patients. Handcuffs or plastic throwaway restraints may cause soft tissue damage. Hog tying can impair breathing and result in positional asphyxia. Question 9. Proper care for a child with epiglottitis should include Taking the child's temperature Putting the child in a supine position Inserting an oral airway Transporting the child to the hospital Answer is D. Transporting the child to the hospital Never place an object such as a thermometer, tongue blade, or oral airway into the mouth of a child with epiglottitis, as this could obstruct the airway. The child should not be forced to lie down, which may be uncomfortable, but should be transported to the hospital in a sitting position on his or her parent's lap. Question 10. In treating an infant or child with fever, you should Apply rubbing alcohol to reduce the patient's temperature. Transport the patient to the hospital. Submerge the child in cold water. Apply towel soaked in cold water. Answer is B. Transport the patient to the hospital. Do not use rubbing alcohol to reduce the child's temperature because it can be toxic if absorbed in high amounts. Submerging the child in cold water or applying cold towels can result in hypothermia. 
The child should be transported to the hospital as soon as possible. Question 11. The best line of treatment for a child with diarrhea and vomiting is to allow the child to sip some water or chipped ice. Maintain an open airway and administer oxygen. Insert an oropharyngeal airway. Administer an anti-diarrheal. Answer is B. Maintain an open airway and administer oxygen. The best line of treatment for a child with diarrhea and vomiting is to maintain an open airway and administer oxygen. Oral suctioning may be required for vomiting. Sipping water or ice chips is usually recommended for children with diarrhea only. Question 12. To first step in assessing a child with fever should be to obtain an oral temperature. Obtain a rectal temperature. Determine the child's temperature using a skin thermometer. Cover the child with towels soaked in tepid water. Answer is C. Determine the child's temperature using a skin thermometer. The first step in assessing a child with fever is to obtain a relative skin temperature using a skin thermometer or by applying the back of your hand to the child's forehead or abdomen. Oral or rectal temperatures are generally not taken in the pre-hospital setting. Question 13. On transport to the hospital, the child suddenly has a seizure. You should immediately provide oxygen. Insert an oropharyngeal airway. Insert a bite stick. Keep the child covered and wait until arrival at the hospital. Answer is A. Provide oxygen. If a child has a seizure on transport, you should maintain an open airway and administer oxygen. Never insert an oropharyngeal airway or a bite stick. Seizures caused by fever should always be considered life-threatening. Question 14. Signs of iron poisoning in a child include hyperventilation, drowsiness, irritability, bloody vomiting. Answer is D. Bloody vomiting. Consuming even small amounts of iron can be life-threatening in children. Usual signs of iron poisoning include nausea, diarrhea, and bloody vomiting. Question 15. In treating a child with meningitis, an EMTB should always assess for shock. Call medical direction. Wear a surgical mask. Obtain a relative skin temperature. Answer is C. Wear a surgical mask. Because meningitis is an airborne disease, a surgical mask should always be worn when caring for a child with suspected meningitis. An EMTB with possible exposure to meningitis should be evaluated by a physician as soon as possible. Question 16. Which of the following statements regarding use of the ambulance siren is false? Use the siren when close to alert the driver of a vehicle ahead. Continuous use of a siren can increase an operator's driving speed. Use of a siren can make motorists less inclined to give the right of way. Use of a siren can worsen the condition of a patient. Answer is A. Use the siren when close to alert the driver of a vehicle ahead. Sounding the siren when close to another vehicle can result in the driver panicking and jamming on his brakes, use the horn to alert the driver instead. Continuous use of a siren can make motorists less likely to yield the right of way, can increase stress and anxiety in injured or ill patients, and has been associated with increased operator driving speed. Question 17. En route to a call, an emergency vehicle is not allowed to pass in a no-passing zone, exceed the speed limit, pass a school bus with red lights blinking, Pass through a stop sign. Answer is C. Pass a school bus with red lights blinking. An emergency vehicle is allowed to pass in a no passing zone, exceed the speed limit, and pass through a stop sign as long as it is safe to do so. However, in the case of a school bus with blinking red lights, the operator of the vehicle should wait for the bus driver to clear the children and turn off the red lights. Question 18 Which of the following statements regarding use of visual warning devices in an emergency vehicle is false? Headlights should be kept on both day and night. Four-way flashers can be used as emergency lights. Alternating flashing headlights should only be used if attached to secondary headlamps. Lights should blink in tandem rather than in an alternating pattern. Answer is B. Four-way flashers can be used as emergency lights. Four-way flashers or directional signals should not be used as emergency lights because they can confuse other drivers. Question 19. Which of the following steps should be taken when transporting a patient to the hospital? More time should be spent packaging a highly traumatized patient. Sheets and blankets should be kept as loose as possible. Trauma patients should be secured to a spine board or other carrying device. A highly traumatized patient should not be moved until emergency treatment is completed. Answer is C. Trauma patients should be secured to a spine board or other carrying device. Highly traumatized patients should be transported to the hospital as soon as possible. Spending too much time packaging a patient in this condition can result in death. In some cases, the patient must be moved before emergency care is completed. 
Sheets and blankets should be tucked under the mattress and stretcher and the patient secured to a spine board or other patient carrying device. Question 20. Vital signs should be assessed. Every 15 minutes in an unstable patient. Every 5 minutes in an unstable patient. Every 10 minutes in a stable patient. Every 10 minutes in an unstable patient. Answer is B. Every 5 minutes in an unstable patient. Vital signs should be assessed every 5 minutes in an unstable patient and every 15 minutes in a stable patient. Question 21. When transferring a patient without serious injury to the emergency department, you should keep the patient in the ambulance until the operator decides where he or she should be taken. Bring the patient directly into the emergency room, then leave the scene. Place the patient in a hospital bed, then leave the scene. Submit a pre-hospital care report, then leave the scene. Answer is A. Keep the patient in the ambulance until the operator decides where he or she should be taken. A non-emergency patient should never be left alone, and EMTB should remain with the patient at all times. In cases when the emergency department is especially busy, the patient can remain in the ambulance until the operator decides where he or she should be taken. Question 22. Which of the following statements regarding stabilization of a collision vehicle is true? A vehicle upright on four wheels should be considered stable. The tires on an upright vehicle should be deflated. To stabilize a vehicle that has fallen on its side, kneel down to place cribbing. Stabilization is required in a vehicle with a crushed roof. Answer is B. The tires on an upright vehicle should be deflated. Although a vehicle that is upright on all four wheels appears stable, it can be rocked forward or backward or side to side, possibly injuring those inside. The tires of an upright vehicle should always be deflated during stabilization. When placing cribbing, you should never kneel down, Maintain a squatting position on both feet to move quickly in case the car moves suddenly. Stabilization is unnecessary only in the case of a car with its roof crushed flat against the body. Question 23. In the care of a patient with hazardous materials injuries, you should make sure the patient has been decontaminated. Transport the patient immediately. Begin care only after the patient has been moved to a safe zone. Wait for arrival of the hazardous materials, hazmat, team before treating the patient. Answer is A. Make sure the patient has been decontaminated. Always make sure the patient has been decontaminated before transporting him or her to the hospital. A contaminated patient or EMTB can contaminate the entire ambulance team. If a patient requires immediate life-saving care, even if he or she has not been decontaminated, you should provide that care, being careful to wear protective clothing and to decontaminate yourself as soon as possible. Question 24. In initial triage, a patient in cardiac arrest is considered priority one in the following situation. Under all circumstances. In cases of severe hypothermia. In cases of cold water drowning. When ample resources are available. Answer is D. When ample resources are available. A patient in cardiac arrest is considered priority four or zero because immediate treatment in such a patient is not justified when many other individuals need attention. However, such patients can be upgraded to priority 1 when ample resources become available. Question 25. In the case of a multiple casualty incident, patients should be transported. Immediately. Only under the direction of a transportation officer. Within 30 minutes of notification. Under direction of radio dispatch. Answer is B. Only under the direction of a transportation officer. In the case of an accident involving multiple casualties, an ambulance should not transport patients without approval of the transportation officer. Failure to comply with the directions of a transportation officer could result in patients being taken to the wrong treatment facility. Question 26. A child's airway differs from that of an adult because the tongue is smaller. The chest wall is more rigid. The tongue is larger. The trachea is wider. Answer is C. The tongue is larger. In a child, the tongue is larger, the chest wall is softer and the trachea is narrower compared with those of an adult. Question 27. Which side of inadequate breathing is more often found in children than adults? Seesaw breathing. Cyanosis. Diminished breath sounds. Inability to speak. Answer is A. Seesaw breathing. Seesaw breathing, in which the chest and abdomen move in opposite directions, often occurs in children but not adults with inadequate breathing. Question 28. Which of the following is not a complication of orotracheal intubation? Hypoxia. Soft tissue trauma. Increased heart rate. Decreased heart rate. Answer is C. Increased heart rate. Orotracheal intubation may stimulate the airway, resulting in slowing of the heart rate. Question 29. What is the problem in the case of an infiltrated 4? 
The fourth fluid flows into surrounding tissue. The fourth flow rate is too fast. Tubing is caught under the backboard. Tubing has pulled out of the catheter. Answer is A. The fourth fluid flows into surrounding tissue. In the case of an infiltrated four, the needle has either punctured the vein and exited the other side or pulled out of the vein entirely, resulting in fluid flowing into the surrounding tissue. The fourth flow should be stopped and the fourth discontinued. Question 30. A potentially serious sign or symptom associated with an acute stress reaction is difficulty sleeping, nausea, loss of appetite, uncontrollable crying. Answer is D. Uncontrollable crying. Signs or symptoms indicative of an acute psychological problem following a stressful event include uncontrollable crying, inappropriate behavior, or irrational thoughts. However, nausea, loss of appetite, or difficulty sleeping are typical reactions and usually do not require intervention. Question 31. The first step in assessing the mother should be perform CPR, determine responsiveness, open the airway, resuscitate for one minute, then activate EMS. Answer is B. Determine responsiveness. The first step in assessing an adult patient who has collapsed is to determine responsiveness. This can be done by gently tapping the patient and asking, are you okay? If the patient is able to respond, resuscitation is unnecessary. Question 32. The first step in assessing the child should be resuscitate for one minute, then activate EMS. Open the airway. Activate EMS. Take a pulse. Answer is A. Resuscitate for one minute, then activate EMS. The first step in treating an unconscious child or infant is to resuscitate for one minute, then activate EMS. Question 33. To assess circulation in the child, you should feel for the brachial artery, feel for the carotid artery, perform chest compression, perform CPR. Answer is B. Feel for the carotid artery. To determine the pulse of an adult or a child, you should feel for the carotid artery, feel for the brachial artery in infants. Question 34. If an adult patient has stopped breathing but has a pulse, you should perform chest compression, begin CPR, provide rescue breathing, open the airway. Answer is C. Provide rescue breathing. If the patient has a pulse, chest compression is not required. If the patient is not breathing, provide artificial ventilation. If the patient has stopped breathing and has no pulse, begin CPR. Question 35. To open the airway of an unconscious patient with a possible spinal injury. Perform the head tilt maneuver. Perform the chin lift maneuver. Rotate the patient's head. Perform the jaw thrust maneuver. Answer is D. Perform the jaw thrust maneuver. The jaw thrust maneuver is the only recommended procedure for opening the airway in an unconscious patient with a possible spinal injury. Question 36. In the case of a patient with gastric distension and vomiting, you should turn the patient's head, roll the patient onto his side, place the patient in a supine position, perform rescue breathing, answer is B. Roll the patient onto his side. Rescue breathing can blow air into the patient's stomach, causing distension. In the case of gastric distension and vomiting, roll the patient onto his or her side. Simply turning the patient's head can lead to aspiration of vomitus or aggravation of spinal injury. Question 37. The correct position for releasing chest compression should be to place your hands on the patient's sternum and move from the hips. Lift your hands away from the sternum. Bend your elbows and lift your hands from the sternum. Keep your knees and elbows bent. Answer is A. Place your hands on the patient's sternum and move from the hips. When releasing chest compression, you should straighten your arms, lock your elbows, and keep your hands on the patient's sternum. Move from the hips, which should act as a fulcrum. Question 38. Muscles connect to bones via which of the following? Ligaments. Nerves. Myofibril. Tendons. Answer is D. Tendons. Tendons connect muscles to bones. Question 39. In treating a laceration, you should Gently probe the edges of the laceration to see the extent of the wound. Apply butterfly bandages and leave the patient in the emergency department. Check the patient's pulse. Bandage the laceration immediately. Answer is C. Check the patient's pulse. A laceration may not seem to be serious, but can result in severe infection or scarring if not treated properly. The patient's pulse should be checked, as well as motor and sensory function distal to the injury. Question 40. In caring for a patient with a puncture wound from an impaled object, you should remove the object, put pressure on the object, bandage the wounded area, stabilize the object. Answer is D. Stabilize the object. 
never try to remove an impaled object, twisting or putting pressure on the object can cause additional injury. Instead, stabilize the object by applying a bulky dressing. Question 41. The best way to save an avulsed body part is to put the part in dry ice. Immerse the part in ice water. Wrap the part in a dry sterile dressing. Immerse the part in saline. Answer is C. Wrap the part in a dry sterile dressing. The avulsed body part should be saved by wrapping it in a dry sterile dressing and then placing it in a plastic bag, plastic wrap, or aluminum foil. Do not place the part in dry ice, water, or saline. Question 42. Which of the following statements regarding abdominal bullet wounds is true? An abdominal gunshot wound without an exit wound can be dangerous. Internal abdominal injury from a bullet wound can be easily detected. Only the area directly underneath an entrance wound may be seriously injured. Only the area directly underneath an exit wound may be seriously injured. Answer is A. An abdominal gunshot wound without an exit wound can be dangerous. Contrary to popular belief, a gunshot wound to the abdomen without an exit wound may still cause serious injury. Bullets can be deflected or explode, sending out pieces that can injure adjacent areas of the body. Question 43. Which of the following statements regarding burns is false? Chemical burns can burn continuously for days. Alkaline chemicals can enter the bloodstream via burns. The age of the patient should be considered when assessing burns. An electrical burn is usually not serious. Answer is D. An electrical burn is usually not serious. Although burns caused by electrical current may result in relatively minor skin injury, they can present a high risk of severe internal injury. Question 44. According to the rule of nines, which of the following is true? An infant's head involves the same amount of body surface as an adult's. An infant's head accounts for 18% of body surface. Each lower limb in an adult accounts for 13.5% of body surface. An adult's head accounts for 18% of body surface. Answer is B. An infant's head accounts for 18% of body surface. Compared with that of an adult, an infant's head is larger in proportion to the rest of the body. Thus, while an adult's head accounts for 9% of body surface area, an infant's head accounts for 18%. Question 45. Which of the following types of burns can be treated by flushing with water? Carbolic acid. Dry lime. Hydrofluoric acid. Electrical burns. Answer is C. Hydrofluoric acid. Burns caused by hydrofluoric acid, a chemical commonly used in manufacturing, should be flushed with water as soon as possible. Question 46. Chemical burns to the eyes should be treated by flushing with vinegar or baking soda, covering the eye with a moistened pad, flooding the eye with water for at least 20 minutes, covering the eye and transporting the patient. Answer is C. Flooding the eye with water for at least 20 minutes. In treating a chemical burn to the eye, immediately flood the eye with water. Continue washing the eye during transport for at least 20 minutes or until arrival at the hospital. Do not use vinegar or baking soda to neutralize the chemical. Question 47. In bandaging an open wound, you should take care to cover the fingers and toes. Leave the fingers and toes exposed. Remove blood-soaked dressings. Tightly bandage the wound. Answer is B. Leave the fingers and toes exposed. In bandaging an open wound, take care not to bandage too tightly or too loosely and do not leave loose ends. Fingers and toes should remain exposed to observe changes in circulation unless they have been burned. In that case, they should be covered. Question 48. In initial triage, the two patients with breathing difficulties should be classified as Priority 2. Priority 1. Priority 4. Priority 3. Answer is B. Priority 1. Patients with treatable injuries that may be life-threatening such as airway or breathing difficulties should be classified as priority 1 and treated first. Question 49. The elderly driver of the SUV has gone into cardiac arrest. This patient should be classified as Priority 1. Priority 4. Priority 2. Priority 3. Answer is B. Priority 4. A patient who has gone into cardiac arrest should be classified as priority 4 or 0. These patients should not receive treatment unless none of the other patients are at risk of dying or sustaining long-term disability if left untreated. Question 50. The bus driver should be classified as Priority 1. Priority 4. Priority 2. Priority 3. Answer is C. Priority 2. Patients with back injuries with or without spinal cord damage should be classified as priority 2.